So hello everyone, and um, I'm back again to talk to someone else in our lovely language learning community. And today it's Michelle Froyer, and she has the Intrepid Language Guide and has grown this amazing um, language learning story linked with travel, linked with beautiful photography. If you haven't seen her Instagram, you have to check it out. We'll put a link in the description. But what I wanna talk about today is less about that, even though that is important, and you can find out more about it, I'm sure, um, and she'll tell you all about how to find her in the end. But I actually wanted to talk about something we hit upon during a Clubhouse discussion uh, last week. And it was all about her language history with Italian and her family and her origins and her roots. And heritage languages are things, I think, that just strike a chord with so many people. Uh, in so many parts of the world and first of all hello Michelle and uh, thank you for hello Richard <laughs> thank you for having me it's a pleasure well the pleasure is all mine and it's now going to be all of yours as well because you're going to listen to the wonderful Michelle talking about this would you mind sharing that story again um, I know we shared it on Clubhouse but we can't record Clubhouse and I, I just thought your story was just so nice that it had to be shared uh, more widely and recorded Oh, thank you. I'm sure um, my nonno, my Italian grandfather, would be very proud that I'm sharing this story with you today. I know that my dad would be tickled pink in his words, as he would say. Um, okay, so my name is Michelle. I'm Australian, but I'm based here in London now. And I am the youngest of three daughters. Um, and my dad is was an Italian immigrant who immigrated when he was four years old from Italy. He immigrated to Australia with his family. And this was after the Second World War. So you can only imagine the conditions that they were trying to escape from and yeah, trying to find a new and better life in Australia. Um, so my dad is from uh, the region of Puglia, which is on the heel of the boot of Italy and from a tiny little village north of Foggia, which is one of the main towns in, uh, in Puglia, or cities, I should say. And um, yeah, when he was four years old, his dad, so my nonno, which is Italian for grandfather, who's named Michele, so we have the same name. He traveled to, to Australia first to go and suss out the situation, as we would say. So he went to, he traveled to Naples and he took one of the, uh, the boats there or the ships and he went to Australia. And he was there for a year just to sort of see if it was going to be a good place for him and his family. And then he sent word back to Italy to, point, um, well, the town is called San Marco in Lamas. Um, and yeah, he basically said that uh, my grandmother, my nonna, and his two children, so my dad, Leonardo, and his sister, Maria, that they should come out and join him as, long, as well as the rest of the family. So they did that. They all traveled to Naples. They got on a ship and a group of them traveled. It took about a month or so, my understanding is, to get to the port of Melbourne in Victoria in Australia and this was yeah in the 50s and um, that was where they started their new life and uh, um, when uh, well my dad spoke the dialect of his um, his town growing up in the household so he didn't go through the Italian education system and he didn't go to a, an Italian school in Australia so he grew up speaking English outside of the home but speaking his dialect at home and yeah, a few years later, he met my mum. Uh, they had three daughters. Uh, they were hoping that the last one at least that they were planning to have would be a boy. And uh, it didn't turn out that way, but nonetheless, my dad decided to still name me after his dad, as you do in Italian culture and Italian tradition. You name your children after close people in your family, so your parents and so on. So yeah, my eldest sister is named after my grandmother, my nonna, Vittoria. Then Nadine, the middle one, was named after, is basically a nickname of my dad's name, which is Leonardo. So her name is Nadine or Nadine. And I'm named after my grandfather, Michele. So dad's like, oh, we're in Australia. No one's going to know that it's, you know, named after Michele, which is basically Michael in Italian. It's just missing that extra L. You know, they'll pronounce it Michelle and that's fine. But he knew in his heart that it was still named after his dad, who he loved to bits and he did a lot for his family. So I grew up with this mindset of being sort of um, a part of this world that couldn't speak the language. And every time I would go and visit my grandfather, because my nonna had passed away when I was still quite young, um, going to visit my grandfather, I was always a bit frustrated that I could never communicate with him because he didn't speak English. 
um, the community that he had, well, all the Italians had sort of moved to was an Italian community. So they didn't need to learn English really. They all spoke to Italian, they spoke Italian with each other. So I felt frustrated that I couldn't communicate with him, especially because, you know, I loved him. You know, I was a child, I loved him. I was named after him. He was, you know, always making me laugh and giving me cuddles and just his face would light up whenever he would see me. And it, uh, yeah, I, I tried to get my dad to teach me a few words, you know, come stai, you know, how are you? And I would try and remember them on the drive back home, come stai, come stai. He's going to ask him five minutes, how do I say, how are you in Italian? And I would sort of try and remember these words, you know, it was like a little curly head Michelle, you know, when I was about six or seven years old. But um, I, I didn't take learning Italian seriously until my nonno passed away. And it was something like a flick of a switch that just went off inside me that it was like, I have to... I really want to learn this language. I want to learn more about my my origins, my grandfather, where he came from, this mysterious, beautiful language that I can't understand. So he passed away when I was about 17. Um, and the first thing I did was I went to a bookstore and I picked up one of those uh, travel phrase guides on, in Italian. And I would lie in bed and I would just flick through this book and you know, see similarities and things that didn't quite match. I'm like, what? Like, what's happening here? Like, why do certain things look the same, but they mean something different? And I'm like, this, this doesn't feel like the right way to go about learning a language. And then I just sort of started thinking about all these people I knew could speak other languages, but how do you actually learn a language, you know? Um, so by the time I was 18 years old, I was able to drive, I was more independent and I found a, uh, a school that was not too far from home that I went to and they were doing Italian lessons in the evening. So I went to that, it was only once a week that they were running it for two hours and I loved it, I enjoyed it and um, I wanted to keep going but there weren't enough students as, you, as usually happens after the first mm -hmm. couple of levels, people sort of start to drop off and there's not enough demand. And then at this point I was, um, traveling to university so I was sort of traveling further out from where I lived and I found another school and yeah it's, it's sort of just snowballed the more I found the more I wanted to learn the more I wanted to learn the more I would go out and sort of surround myself especially in the Italian community in Melbourne because I, I live further away from Melbourne at the time but by this point I had a job in the city so I was commuting to uh, Melbourne uh, centre every day so in the end, I was going to one designated Italian school, which was in the Italian community. I went to another adult school for another lesson. And then we also had an Italian colleague from Bergamo. So he would give me private lessons in one of the meeting rooms at the end of um, the workday. So I was, you know, having three classes, I guess, per week. And then every year we'd have the Italian film festival in Melbourne, which would go over two weeks. And it was my favorite time of the year because I would go there after work and I would watch literally two movies after work at night. So I'd have to rush there to get the six o'clock show. Then I would see another one at about eight or 8.30. Then that would finish around 10 o'clock and then I'd have to commute all the way back home, which would take me over an hour or so. It took me an hour and a half to get back home because I live so far away. But it was just a labor of love. I just loved it. It was, I was so passionate about it and it was my way to immerse myself in the language any way I could. I would make my friends go to Italian restaurants. Um, yeah, I just, I did everything I could just to surround myself with the people, the language, and just wanting to learn more about the culture. And then it got to a point where I said, Dad, I, I really want to move to Italy. Like, I want to see if I can survive there. I was at a B1, B2-ish level. And Dad was excited and he supported me and I couldn't have done it without his support. And so I went to Italy on, it was like a seven, seven week trip because I had accrued, accrued up so much annual leave. So I did three weeks um, state language study holiday in Rome and then two weeks in Florence and then a little bit of extra time to travel around and go and visit some of my old Italian teachers who had moved back. And I, that was my first trip as a solo traveler. First time using Italian since I had visited once before and I didn't really know anything. And I loved it. Of course I loved it. So I came back, I said to dad, I really want to do this. I really want to move there. And I quit my job. And then three months later, I had my visa and I went and I moved to Rome. And that sort of started the whole new adventure for me. And I was hoping to live there indefinitely, but for reasons of visas and things like that, I couldn't stay. I don't have a European passport. 
So I had to make a quick decision to come to the UK before my 30th birthday so I could get a visa to be here. And I've been in London ever since, so the past seven years. But when I came here, I was really missing the whole daily challenge of learning about a new language, a new culture, being exposed to foreign things, laughing at things that didn't make sense to me or you know, there's things that don't quite work the same way as they do in Australia, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt and take it as a learning experience. And I would just enjoy that, you know, like um, I enjoyed that, uh, that daily uh, challenge and constantly learning is what I missed. So when I moved to London, I started the Intrepid Guide, which is my language and travel website. And it's basically a place where I get to express my passions for languages and travel and encourage others to want to start to learn a bit of the local language as part of their travels as a way of having more authentic and more personal and more enriching experiences when they travel. Um, you know, you don't need to be fluent, you know, you can be travel fluent, so enough that you can get by, to be pleasant, to be polite to people, because a little can go a long way, especially when you're just starting out and it shows that you're making an effort. Um, so yeah, that's sort of uh, where we are now. I'm here in London and hoping that one day I can, yeah, return to Italy and um, yeah, go back to that daily challenge, but we'll, we'll see how things go. <laughs> I mean, the story, to be honest with you, I was just listening to you talking about it again, as attentively as I was the first time I heard it. And, and that's the second time I've heard the story. And it's still for me, it just makes me, it, it still gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, of, of someone going on a boat all the way around the world. I can imagine, you know, your, your, your grandparents had no idea what was really going to be there in Australia. I mean, just yeah. going all that way by boat, it, it, as you say, it's taken over a month or more to get there. And then arriving there, possibly not knowing the language at all or very well, um, speaking, as you said, from the south of Italy, an Italian dialect that wasn't the standard language of, of what we now know as standard Italian. And I, I guess all of those things sort of play in together for just this, you know, the, the, the old films that you imagine, you know, and you, you see on mm. TV of, of people trekking halfway across the world uh, to start a new life. There's something quite romantic about it. And then I can really identify with you when you talk about this with um, the loss of a language within a family because I have that as well with, with Welsh. My grandparents, uh, uh, my, my, my nan's parents spoke Welsh as a first language. And, um, and when they had their children, they, they moved to Liverpool for work reasons and different things. And they thought that it was a bad idea to speak to their children in Welsh because it was seen as a sort of a, an uneducated language and language that was inferior to English and English was the way forward and I don't know if you if you if you've picked up on anything like that within your family as well speaking a dialect of Italian particularly mm. not speaking the standard there's kind yeah, of that's interesting. a language yeah. snobbery right that about it and even if we're the speakers of the language it's almost imposed on us from other people who have spoken at us that we should speak this other way yeah there is definitely a bit of that actually and the more that I think about it the more obvious it is but it's not until you sort of mention it that I think about it more so there's a few things there's okay so the reason why I didn't grow up speaking Italian is because my dad didn't teach us or speak to us in his version so his dialect of Italian so he tried to in the beginning with my eldest sister Vittoria but my grandparents, they would chime in and say, no, 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 that's how we say it, but that's not proper Italian. No, don't teach her that, don't teach her that. So because dad didn't know any better, dad didn't know anything other than his dialect. He's like, oh, you know, forget about it, you know, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So he didn't teach my sister and therefore we didn't learn it, the other two of us. So that's sort of one part of it. Another thing I guess is, I guess they didn't see it as important because they didn't ever think that they would ever go back to Italy. My dad said to me that my nonna was like, no, this is our life now in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't need our Italian passports anymore. And this is part of the reason why I can't, I don't have an Italian passport is because no, this is our life now. Um, we're not going back. This is it. Like, you know, there's nothing to go back to basically. This is our home. We should focus on being here in Australia. Mm -hmm. So 
that sorry that sort of mentality had carried through and I guess they didn't see the importance of us learning Italian because oh, what do they need to learn Italian for you know we're in Australia we speak English in Australia even though they, they didn't learn English they could understand but they didn't speak yeah. the language um, so yeah I, I definitely feel like there is some sort of that even if it's on a subconscious level or if it was just because of the times like things were so difficult back then that they could ever imagine what sort of air travel is able to do for us nowadays and how we can travel with visas and work opportunities and you know language holidays and things like that it wasn't it wasn't something that was commonplace back then so I completely understand that mentality but it has sort of trickled through to the other generations so yeah it is quite complicated especially with like the agreements between countries how you can claim your citizenship um but unfortunately i i missed the boat so to speak on that one yeah yeah and, and you know what it's like you say um that idea that mentality of we've gone we've made a new life in australia and this is our life now um i'm sure there are people who are going to be watching this who can identify from their own family stories as well of the family made the trip, they made that transition, they made that move, and they became as Australian as Australian can be. And the, the same would be true for many of the other countries that people fled from and went to uh, during difficult times, or just out of choice, sometimes economic reasons as well. And that happens in so many places. I've heard stories like this many times that you have grand grandchildren that can't speak to their grandparents anymore. And the grandparents, even though they don't speak the grandchildren's new language, they, 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 they still are the strongest advocates for the, the grandchildren adopting and being as Australian as possible, or as American as possible, or as Canadian as possible, or as British as possible, or whatever it is. Um, they're, they're, they're stronger advocates for it sometimes because they see it as this is the future, this is the way forward. Like, my great grandparents did with with our family. Why why bother with Welsh? You don't need that now. We 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 can speak English, and and it will, will just confuse you speaking Welsh. And we're coming up to the moment for the day of multilingualism, as we're, we're speaking now on the twenty seventh of March is the day for multilingualism. And for me, multilingualism isn't just about language. And uh, when we think about language in the strictest sense of the of the of the, of the word because dialects and languages was kind of a weird um, gray area where they sort of start and end. And when you were telling me about the Southern Italian uh, dialect that your family had, thinking about that as a dialect, was it a dialect? Was it almost like a different language to what we see as now standard Italian? Um, you know, the, the, the dialect that I originally spoke in English is Scouse. And, and Scouse is quite different to standard English. There's some different grammar in Scouse than there is in standard English. Uh, there's definitely different words that we have that, that don't exist in standard English. Um, and the same is true in many other parts of the United Kingdom and other parts of the world generally, where you've got a standard form that's seen as the prestigious form, and then you've got other ones. And I think there's something to be said about having a day like the 27th of, of March, where we actually feel proud of our our dialects and our languages and the multi-linguistic aspect of, of the whole, not just saying that you speak French, German, Spanish, and, and that's it. Actually, no, speaking Napolitano, speaking, um, I don't know. Siciliano. Exactly. <laughs> or, 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 speaking, or speaking Scouse, or speaking mm. Scots, or speaking another, another language like Scots in the United Kingdom. You know, it, these are, are all things that we should be and can be proud of on a multilingual day and and hope that we can learn to celebrate it in the more monolingual societies. Um, Absolutely. There's so definitely a lot more flavour to be found in dialects or, you know, other languages within a language, I guess. So in, in Italian, in this example, my dad, um, growing up, I didn't understand these, but he would like um say these like kind of Italian nursery rhymes but in his dialect I can't remember them but when I hear him say it they're just so funny like just little things about you know an old Italian couple and it's just like this rhyming um a rhyming poem but my grandfather would say that to me and I was always giggle even though I didn't understand what he was saying to me but he made it fun 
<laughs> by his gestures, by the way he would, you know, um, say this rhyme to me. And then my dad started to say it afterwards and he sort of carried that on. But I, being apart from, like being an adult now, being apart from my family and having this new appreciation for my heritage and my heritage language, I wish that I could be them, be there with them to capture all these things. I want to record them. I want to savor them. I want to, there's like, there's so many stories and so many things that they know that I haven't been taught or it hasn't been passed on. And I want to capture them somehow so they're not lost forever. Um, uh, when I was living in Italy, my dad came to visit me. He surprised me. I didn't know he was coming. And it was around Easter time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he came to visit. And then we decided that we would go to Puglia to go to his village together. Oh. And that was awesome. That was like, oh, I, I can't express what that felt like. But to go and to see where he grew up, this tiny place in the middle of nowhere, tiny, tiny village where they still put like um, hot coals under the bed to warm the bed, where oh, there's wow. not like proper plumbing. Like this was, it felt like I was traveling back in time. And when we were there, I saw the church where my grandparents got married. I saw the house where my grandfather would court my grandmother from outside. Like she wouldn't let him come in. It was like cold winter. And they would talk to each other. She would be in, you know, in the um, bedroom and she would talk to him from the street level, you know, this whole original way that they would court each other. And she wasn't too sure about him, so she wouldn't let him come in the house. But he would go there and speak to her and he eventually proposed, obviously. But just sort of being in that spot and imagining what that was like all those years ago and for me to be here with my dad was incredible. And uh, another thing I remember from that trip was that someone had commented up to my dad saying, what, what are you talking about? Like, we don't talk like that anymore. Like he was basically, his language, his dialect was a time capsule from 60 years ago, you know, when we were there. And I just thought how interesting that was that obviously that the language in the country that you've immigrated from, that usually goes forward or changes or modernizes or however you want to describe it. But he had maintained this dialect that they don't speak anymore. And if he doesn't pass that on, obviously that's that piece of history, that piece of culture, that richness is lost, which is really sad. Um, so it's just sort of these little, you know, being able to travel there and to imagine, you, it gives you a newfound appreciation for your heritage and, and for languages. And then try and you think about, well, if, if, if this is true in a tone, that it could be true and is true for other languages. So it opens your eyes in so many ways, not just for your own language that you're learning or for your own heritage. So. Yeah. I love that you went to the church though your grandparents yeah. got married. That's so moving. It's so so it was. Nice. It was. Yeah, we both shed a tear that day. I can, that I can was, imagine. Yeah. That's such a special thing to be able to, to go and do. And it, actually that reminds me, whenever I travel anywhere, I actually really appreciate being in groups with with people from, from the US or Canada or Australia um, or New Zealand or somewhere where you have in sort of living memory this connection to an, an old the old country right mm -hmm. and there's something quite special about traveling with people from those countries for me as a as a brit because as europeans we tend to be like oh yeah it's that old church it's like 400 years <laughs> old or whatever it is and no <laughs> europeans are are quite quite bad at sort of appreciating <laughs> sometimes I'm not going to say all the time because there are Europeans that definitely do appreciate it and I'm, I'm generalizing so take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt but more often than not when I'm with with people especially I've, I've traveled quite a few with quite a few um, people from the U.S. and they're just the wonder on their faces as they look at this old architecture and and they and they stand there and they'll imagine I've got Ameri you know friends from the US who will imagine and they'll sit there and go can you imagine who's touched this who's been through this place and I don't think I've really ever been with Europeans and they stood there <laughs> and done that in the same yeah. way unless they're a bit older it tends it tends to be an older European thing to do when they reminisce, you know, on family and what it might have been like. But younger people didn't tend to do that. Whereas younger Australians, particularly and and uh, Americans and uh, and Canadians, would do that quite a lot. And and I just loved just seeing things through their eyes because I it almost would breathe new life into every experience for me. Um, just appreciating Europe and the things that. 
I think I also took for granted as well in a completely yeah. different way. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I love tourists from those countries because for all of those reasons. And hearing you talking about that now, it, it just reminds me of many of those stories that I have as well. And uh, friends going to find their family, For one, a friend from the US who went to retrace his family from the Czech Republic. And I went on that journey with him and his family. Yeah. And it reminds me of that, exactly this. And he was talking about it and they were all emotional and trying to meet, meet the locals and talk to them. And like you say, your dad was speaking like the old way of, of speaking. There's yeah. something quite special about it, you know. <laughs> It is. I know that I thought it was strange that their language had moved on, but obviously his had remained, but they still didn't have like, you know, proper plumbing yet. And they, but yet their language had moved on, but they didn't have plumbing or they didn't have heating. You know, they were putting hot coals under the bed to warm the bed. And I just thought how strange this is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I totally understand that whole perspective of, you know, from Australia, we're such a young country. We don't have buildings that are like hundreds and hundreds of years old or even like the roman ruins that you have you know thousands of years old um so for us when we see a building that's a hundred years old we're like wow but then you go to europe and everything is like hundreds of years old or thousands so there's um it's yeah. definitely more challenging for us to to imagine but we love doing it and that's why you find a lot of Australians that just love traveling around Europe because it's so different from what we're used to we we're surrounded by a lot of natural beauty and then we come to Europe and it's a lot of history yeah I suppose unless you've kind of you've got the contact with the indigenous cultures of Australia mm -hmm. and then obviously then the, the the generations do go back and the stories and the languages and stuff do go back yeah they um I was talking to the Australian Tourism Board and they were sharing a lot of their Indigenous experiences that you can have now with um, with people of the area that you're visiting. So I'm definitely very keen to go and do that when I'm able to travel back to Australia. Um, and it's not just in places like the Northern Territory where you sort of think of as like the main place where you would be able to come into contact with, you know, uh, Indigenous Australians, but even places in Victoria. Like I grew up in a part where they are now running um these experiences that you can have and learn more about where you grew up and i think that's wonderful mm -hmm. so yeah i'm definitely excited to to learn more about that absolutely yeah oh i'm i'm pleased and it's nice to see those kinds of things happening and obviously um you know we've got people like gillard zuckerman at the university of adelaide who's spoken at the polyglot conference um who works tirelessly with reconstructing some of these uh, indigenous languages in australia um and and now you see information, you know, we, uh, we did a, a language event in, in Melbourne um, in 2019. And, and during that time, we saw uh, and heard about projects to, to sort of get people hearing the indigenous languages, because there are so many. It's not like in New Zealand where you've got Maori, Maori and Maori as the indigenous language. You've got is that like over 300 languages or something uh, in, in wouldn't in be surprised yeah Australia's yeah. a big country <laughs> yeah, it's fairly you think big. about all the different accents in America but you know in Australia when they're isolated and you know, you're not going to walk from you know modern day Melbourne you know to Broome in Western Australia so no exactly it's a, it's a big distance to cover so it makes sense that there are lots of different languages yes and thank you so much for joining us and um, listen, be wonderful to talk to you again and um, just My let pleasure. everyone know where they can find you if they want to find out about your intrepid guide and uh, get in touch with you and we'll put links yeah. in the description. Sure. Uh, so my website is theintrepidguide.com and then I'm on Instagram at Intrepid Guide, Twitter at Intrepid Guide and Facebook the Intrepid Guide and then okay. Easy to the Intrepid Guide for YouTube as well. Yeah. All variations of Intrepid Guide. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll put all the links down below. Uh, please do like and follow and subscribe. And we'll see you next time for another Yay. interview with somebody else who uh, will charm us as hopefully as much as the wonderful Michelle Frollo. You're always Aww. fantastic. What a great smile, what a great <laughs> person and uh, great stories to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Bye, everyone.